Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, this is Stone Carver Nick Benson coming from the John Stevens shop. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. So uh, here is the John Stevens shop. It's a funny little stone carving shop in Newport, Rhode Island. It's the kind of place you'd drive right by. You probably wouldn't even give it a second look. But uh, in a nutshell, what we do is we use a broad edge brush to paint lettering on paper, which we then transfer to stone, and we use mallets and chisels to carve that lettering into stone. And commissions can be as simple as a single character on a single piece of stone, or it can be thousands and thousands of characters in architectural context, or in this case, this is the Martin Luther King Memorial down in Washington, DC. Uh, but oftentimes, people look at this stuff and they say, what on earth are you doing spending all of this time drawing lettering by hand and pecking away with a mallet and chisel when this is the world that we live in? I mean, there are thousands of fonts that we can access through this machine, and we can connect this machine to other machines that will uh, laser etch inscriptions into stone, uh, diamond route inscriptions into stone. Why go the route of, of the old school? And it has a lot to do with this man. This is my my young, dapper grandfather, John Howard Benson. Uh, he was uh, an artist. He was a painter. He was a printmaker. Uh, he had really, really great graphic sensibilities. And uh, when he was done with his education here in New York City, he went to the Art Students League. He got back to Newport, Rhode Island, and he's like, what the hell am I going to do with my life? And he found the John Stevens shop sort of on its last legs, and he thought, you know, I can bring my art education to the monument industry, and I'm going to make monuments the way I want to make them. He always loved the old colonial stones up the street at the Common Burying Ground. And he understood that although most people look at these things and think, you know, they're really naive, funky, crude pieces of work, he understood that they were very complicated, sophisticated, uh, unique pieces of design. All of the subtle iconography and the letter form were sort of uninspired by other work because it was the colonial era, and so these guys were making all this stuff up. Um, the actual physical process of carving letters with the mallet and chisel informed these letters. They were not typographic in any way. This is really vernacular stuff. And so even though you look at the, 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 the funny short center stroke of, of the E in memory, or you look at the way the ampersand is cocked between Barnabas and Lydia, when you look at the whole thing, it has a really wonderful symmetry to it. Look at all of the A's in Barnabas, how beautiful those things are. So while my grandfather's contemplating all of this stuff, of course, this is the, this is the 1920s, and the modern world is, is pressing forward, and mass production is the way of the world. This is the way we're going. The handmade is out, and everything mechanical is in. And the same was true for the typographic world. Uh, type was being produced mechanically now, and sort of modernist movement, as evidenced in the Bauhaus, was really the direction that everything was going. Uh, here's Paul Renner's Futura. This is the quintessential piece of sans serif modernist type where the hand is completely erased and you have this super, super clean form. Every single character is precisely the same. It's all about mechanical perfection. So the same type of thing was happening in the monument trade. This is this really cool little sample that, that John Baskerville actually designed and carved himself. Uh, I, most of you guys might know a Baskerville typeface. Well, this was made by John Baskerville. And this sort of typographic uh, interpretation of things in the monument trade started imprinting itself on gravestones. So this starts to end up lo looking a lot more like a broadside or a, a, a book plate than it does like that really, really interesting, dynamic, vernacular stuff of the earlier days. And this sort of went on and, and became sort of a caricature of itself, almost a cartoonish version of this typographic stuff. The ornamental work became really naturalistic, and then the lettering, you look at the lettering on this stone, it looks like it's made of lead or something. It's, it's, it's really, really, really mechanical and completely and utterly out of sync with the ornamental work. Even the process of carving letters into stone became mechanical. So on the, on the left-hand side here, you have a, a hand-cut V 
cut letter that was hand drawn, and on the right side, you've got a sandblasted character. And sandblasting is a process where you put a rubber mat on stone, and then you cut out a piece of the lettering, represents the lettering, you cut that rubber out, you blast sand under high pressure air at the stone and it etches the material, you pull away the rubber and there's your incised letter. Not particularly sensitive. And this is the state of, of, of monuments that have been designed uh, with the machine and produced with the machine. Not exactly warm and fuzzy. So my grandfather said, screw that. I'm throwing all that stuff out the window. I'm just going to start and use the basic principles that the colonial guys did and make my own stones. So here's an early piece that he did, which is an obvious tie to the colonial stuff. But when you look at the ornamental work, you look really closely at this stuff along the borders, all along here and up in the tympanum. That really has a lot more to do with Art Nouveau than it does with all that really, really funky, like, bizarre sort of uh, quirky stuff that the colonial guys are doing. And then the inscription itself has obvious ties to typographic standards. So this becomes this sort of strange thing that's entirely its own. It, really, you could say it's innovative. Here's another stone that he did that, he, you know, completely dropping all of the connection to colonial stones. He did this very slight peak top. But he's moving further and further in the direction of a sort of contemporary interpretation of monumental work. He was a, a, an art historian, and he, he started looking back at historic forms to help inform design moving forward. It led him to Rome, where he was looking at, at Imperial Roman capital letters and understanding the way in which the Romans laid out their text. Uh, and then he was looking at Carolingian minuscule of the 11th century, which is basically the beginning of lowercase lettering as we understand it. And he was looking at uh, italic forms from the 15th century. And then he injected all of this stuff into lettering that was entirely his own. So this is an alphabet stone that incorporates all of those influences, but it's really cohesive, it's really dynamic, and it's a badass piece of work. I'm telling you. So he, here's, as he went down the Roman road, this is a gravestone that he did that I, I threw in here because I really, really love it. It's, it's something that has immediate ties to the, to the basic uh, concepts of, of Roman layout, but nobody's going confuse to that, confuse that for a Roman piece. It is entirely its own thing. Here's an absolutely stunning tablet that he did over at, at the Met. Again, the same type of thing, um, just the dynamic quality of it is, is just so, so beautiful to me. One of the things that's so inspiring to me when I look at my grandfather's work. So my dad, when he took over the shop in 1963, what happened is the typographic stuff sort of got more and more refined. And there were calligraphers and designers, guys like William Addison Dwiggins and uh, Rudolf Koch and uh, the late, great Hermann Zopf. These guys were coming in and they were injecting a whole bunch of new life into the typographic standard. And my dad was inspired by that. And he used the same tools that my grandfather was using. He was using a broad edge brush. But he tweaked his lettering to become almost typographically perfect in a way. It was like super, super, super refined. And it reached this, this, this pinnacle of, of perfection. But at the same time, it had all of this very subtle idiosyncrasy that it made it human. So in this particular piece, when you look at the two E's in representarte down on the third line, the first E and the second E, you can see that the bowl in the first E is a little bit smaller than the bowl in the second E. Do you see that? This is the kind of thing that I'm talking about, very, very subtle inconsistencies without, within this thing that, that we almost subconsciously pick up on and it, it ties right into the humanity that we connect with this thing. This is not a mechanical piece of work. Then along comes the computer in my dad's age, in, in, in the 80s. We're screwed. Here's the computer, your, your, your life as a, as a letterer is over. And I love the fact that there's a, Adobe Illustrator is the first thing on the, on the computer. Don't you love that? Hello, goodbye. So uh, he saw the computer as really what he should have been looking at, a tool. He saw it as a tool and he said, you know what, I'm gonna use this thing and this was right when he got the commission for the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial down in Washington, D.C., and he designed a site-specific typeface to use in conjunction with hand-cut lettering down there that he drew by hand 
And he really, really, th- th- again, this is a big leap in terms of innovation of him saying, hey, man, this is a really, really great tool that's going to help me make something that I can use in this, in this large architectural context. So this is some of the inscriptional work that's on the way he- heading into the memorial that he drew by hand on this very, very wild and uh, a crazy surface. And then here's a panel where he was using the site-specific typeface. And the two really, really work beautifully in conjunction. So here's little Nikki Benson at age four in the backyard of the John Stevens shop, like totally and utterly clueless as to what was going on around me. There's a, there's a sample, the sample I'm standing from is for the uh, Franklin Delano Rose, I'm sorry, for the John F. Kennedy Memorial in Arlington Cemetery. And it wasn't until I went away to college that I had enough perspective on this, an objective view of the shop to realize, hey, that place is uh, pretty cool. I think I'm, I'm gonna get involved with this. So I went on to, to do a long-term apprenticeship with my dad where he beat the out of me and, you know, like, yeah, yeah, now you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you got to do this. And, and I ended up sort of once I got out on my own and started producing work that was in the shop vein, I was oftentimes heavily influenced by my grandfather. So in this piece, there's a very stylized approach and a sort of classical approach to the inscription that has direct connections to my, my grandfather's approach. And this piece is a lot more like my dad's, where it's a sort of naturalistic sailboat and a much more simple uh, piece of text. Uh, I also took on a lot of the large monumental stuff like my dad. So this is the National World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. And just to walk you guys through a little bit of the process of site-specific typeface design, what I ended up doing for, for that particular job is I brushed out big bodies of the text that I would end up carving on that. And then I made copious notes about what I was brushing, like, no, that's too thick, that's too thin, I like the look of the bowl of the R here, uh, you know, the stroke of the N is cocked this way. And then once I scanned these characters into the machine and started tweaking them in, in Illustrator, uh, I really got a sense of, of what I wanted to do. Now, when you look at this particular image, you see that that R, that's a pretty heavyweight character, you know? Black on a white screen, this thing looks like some sort of blunderbuss Roman. It's really, really heavy. But I'm making conscious decisions in this design process that have everything to do with the way the form's gonna look once it's carved. So it's very, very, very different. It does not actually function typographically. It's meant to be carved in stone. It's a lapidary letter. So here's the typeface as a whole. Again, it gives you a really great sense of how heavy this thing looks, black on a white page. But once it's carved, you really get a much, much better sense of how it was designed ideally for this purpose. Uh, this is the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Four Freedoms Park Memorial over on Roosevelt Island. I don't know if any of you guys have been out there. It's a really, really cool spot. Um, it's the uh, architect Louis Kahn's last design that he did before he died. And uh, it's a you know, modernist monumental piece of architecture that's so, so contemporary. A lot of people are thinking, well, what are you talking about, hand carving letters for a, a Louis Kahn piece? That's, that's really, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So here's the uh, sort of contemplative granite room at the very tip of the park. And this, the block that you see at the, in the center of the photograph there is where we had to, to design and carve the central inscription. So I ended up designing a letter that was meant to be very sort of contemporary, sans serif, clean, but it had this really, really, really subtle sweep to the stroke that I knew would translate well once we carved it into stone. Here's the layout that I did. I, I made really broad line spacing sort of played on this idea of the horizon that, that Khan wove throughout the whole memorial. Uh, sort of a crappy photo, but we got on that wall, we carved for about a month or so, and there's the, there's the inscription. Uh, and when you get up close to it and you actually Put a hand on it. That's the other thing about this. It becomes a real tactical, tactile experience for a lot of people. Kids in particular, they run up to these things, they put their hands on them, they feel them, they want to they wanna be invested in, in these, these letters that have been carved into stone. And this has, a, again, a really, really human feel for something that is sort of, at its heart, contemporary. So I continue to, to go on and make these gravestones, and I will. Uh, and make dedicatory tablets and, and large architectural inscriptions. But I'm heading down a funny rabbit hole of, of design that's inspired by this machine. 
not in terms of, of the way in which I use this machine as a tool to design, but in terms of the flood of information that it represents now. I mean, I was looking at this CNN page, and if this were 25 years ago, and you made this as a poster, and you sh put it up in a crit, people would tear, <laughs> they would say, this is the worst piece of design I've ever seen. But we understand that every single piece of this page leads to an entirely different realm of information, right? And I, I use this because it's a real like sledgehammer over the head in terms of being inundated with information. Sure, it's, it's Times Square, and of course we're inundated that way. But this sort of mentality has injected itself into the monument trade. I mean, this is like, you know, Lorenzo Lamas and, uh, you know, Kevin Costner in the background there. And it is really, really awful, awful stuff. But really, it's this, it's this idea of, of the mass of information that's being, that's being beamed across the world at all times. And that influx of information, the way in which oftentimes it's totally and utterly indecipherable. And it just represents this wave of information that we have to kind of deal with and cope with. And we do, we, 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 we all have our specialized way of dealing with, with all sorts of information, but oftentimes we do step back and say, damn, this is a lot to take in. So early on, I, I started making interwoven bodies of text that uh, were definitely along the lines of the historic uh, precedents in calligraphic form. This is italic capital lettering, but it's all woven together into a slightly sort of confusing body of text, and I went further and further down this road. This is actually a piece of lorem ipsum in uh, lorem ipsum is filler text that graphic designers use, and it is in Latin, and uh, everything about this is the sort of flip side of what I do at the John Stevens shop on a day-to-day -day basis. What we do daily is we we are hired by the client to convey a certain piece of information, and the conveying of that information is 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 paramount. You have to understand the information immediately, and the aesthetic is secondary. This is the flip side. Aesthetic is what you get hit over the head with first, and then you have to contemplate the information. Uh, this is a really wacky piece that I did recently that I can't even talk about. Okay, so <laughs> this one <laughs> is, I, I started thinking more and more about uh, sort of mathematics and things, and this is Peter Higgs, uh, the, the physicist's uh, mathematical formula for the uh, standard model of the universe. So I saw uh, on Netflix, I saw the, uh, the film all about the Large Hadron Collider over there, particle fever. And it got me so cranked up about this notion of, again, all of this information. So I saw this, this piece of mathematics and I thought, oh man, I'm going to do a calligraphic version of that. Uh, and then again, this is, this is steps in process. I do an outline drawing of the calligraphy that I've done. And then I very, very, very carefully and maniacally carve it into stone with a mallet and chisel. So there's this crazy sort of immediacy of the really, really loose calligraphic form, but when you get up to it, you see that I've spent hundreds of hours carving with a mallet and chisel really, really precisely this whole thing. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure where this is going to lead me, but I find it a really, really interesting experiment. And um, I'm sure going to do a hot, whole lot more of it. So that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you.